Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I try to smile a while at the beginning so I can get a thumbnail of me smiling. And that is my performing masking part. Um, and actually, this is the second take of this video because I did the whole thing and then realized that I had forgot to press record. So my rehearsing part is excited about that. But I am affectionately naming this video IFS, HSP, ASD, CPTSD, and the Enneagram, a personal story. And as you can see, I have a part that gets a kick out of all those letters all together. Um, and hopefully we can make some sense out of them. I'm not going to explain what they mean extensively, but I'll give you some idea if you don't already know. So let's start with HSP. So as long as I can remember, I have been an HSP, a highly sensitive person. And what that looked like when I was young was that I was very sensitive to bright lights, certain textures of clothing, of food, sounds, smells, uh, just a lot of sensory input was very overwhelming to me. I remember uh, being young and being so terrified of the loud sounds of sirens or being terrified of the party game where you would go around and pop the balloons on other people's that were attached to the other kids' ankles. I hated that. Um, I hated certain foods, it just certain sounds, smells just made me suffer inside, it seemed, to a degree that other people didn't. And so at that time, I thought that I was just weak. There was something wrong with me. And it wasn't just sensory things. It was emotions. I was very highly or easily, I guess, upset, it seemed. I would hear people constantly saying, why are you so sensitive? Don't be so sensitive. Don't be such a crybaby. But things just seem to affect me more than they did other people. I also, even from a quite a young age, was quite serious and would always want to bring things to a deeper level or a more meaningful level. I didn't like small talk. I had the very small capacity or energy level um, in general and socially. Uh, so there were all kinds of things like that, that, that pointed to that, but it actually wasn't until six years ago when I had this mysterious illness and the doctors are prescribing me all of these medications. And of course I'm getting every side effect imaginable. And I'm sitting in the nurse practitioner's office again, and just saying, I cannot understand how people survive these medications. And she looks at me and she says, I think you're just a highly sensitive person. And at the time I thought she was insulting me. I thought, yeah, yeah, I know. I've heard that all my life, <laughs> you know? Um, but I think it was several months later that I saw the title of Elaine Aaron's book, The Highly Sensitive Person, and picked that up and read it and found out that this is actually a thing, that a certain percentage of the population of every every species is highly sensitive and that it's actually very helpful to keeping that species alive. And so I happen to be in this unique elite group. And so at that time, again, this is when I was 42, that I started to begin to say, maybe this isn't a curse. Maybe this is a gift. Maybe it's not a weakness. Maybe it's a strength, right? I'm empathic. I'm I can highly attune, I can notice things, right? And um, maybe the problem wasn't necessarily me, but it was the culture that couldn't tolerate or accept me and, and my sensitivity. But of course, as a child, I did not get that. And so I developed all kinds of ways to suppress what I thought was a flaw was bad in me. Um, primarily through these big inner critics that would tell me how awful I was. Stop it, stop it, stop it. Push through, push through, push through your, your limitations. 
and um, and developed performing parts, people pleasing parts, and we'll talk about those in a second. Um, but then just recently, uh, I've been exploring the fact that it's debated right now whether or not people who are HSP are actually on one end of the autism spectrum. And so as I began to explore that and had especially began to listen to stories of women who were self-diagnosed as autistic later in life, because particularly in women, they have a higher capacity and socialization to mask, right? To perform and to suppress perhaps their, their natural qualities. And so as I'm reading all of these stories, I began to really resonate and find freedom in them. Um, and it brought not only a greater self-acceptance, but also an appreciation for all of those critics and all of those protective parts that tried to suppress my natural sensitivities, understanding that they were just doing everything they knew to help me survive early on, especially socially. So um, that was really helpful. And, you know, I began to realize that a lot of the people that I surround myself with are neurodivergent, are people who are sensitive and like to go deep and have limited capacities and we kind of get each other, right? So now it doesn't feel like the world is so different. But then I had this question because the the symptoms, right, of HSP, ASD can really overlap with symptoms of complex trauma, CPTSD. And I've definitely had complex trauma as well from corporal punishment, from religious indoctrinations, and particularly from 13 years of abuse uh, with my first husband. And those things can cause a lot of the same you know, anxieties and sensitivities and um, hypervigilance and fawning and, you know, all of those types of things. And so I thought, okay, how do you decipher which is which? Well, that's where the brilliance of internal family systems comes in. Because in IFS, you can go in directly into your system to whatever part is producing any kind of symptom. And you can ask direct questions and receive the answers. If, as long as you can get intellectual parts and, and other parts to, to give you space, you can receive the insight from them. And it's, it's very clear. So I decided to do that. And what I found out, again, it may be different for you. So this is not uh, prescriptive. This is my experience, just meant to inspire you to explore your own. But um, this is what I found out. So my critics, which there were four big ones, um, my people pleaser, which is like, appears like a, a almost infinite nesting doll of layers and layers and layers, right? It, it, she's been unburdening for over a year now and she's doing fabulously, but she had layers of uh, cultural burdening, religious burdening, legacy burdening, personal burdening, moment after moment after moment after moment where she felt like I am going to die if I don't please the person in front of me. So she is just a huge, huge part. Um, performers, masking parts, uh, rehearsing parts, my, my lovely Sophie, um, and hypervigilant parts. Um, <laughs> there's where that wants to name all, all my parts, but uh, socially anxious parts. They all let me know that their jobs were their burdens, that they had developed these things uh, as a result of trauma in order to protect me. So now that trauma might have been from being HSD, ASD, HSP, ASD. Um, it might have been other things. It's all very interconnected because some of the high sensitivity and maybe the lack of social cue can set a person up in some ways to be taken advantage of. Um, and then they experience abuse that way or, or trauma and abuse. And other times it just comes societally, right? From people who are shaming them or putting them down, or they just get this, this, uh, like I did this pervasive, 
uh, sense that they're flawed, that something's wrong with them. So parts of them take on this burden of, I am shameful, right? So all of these parts revealed to me that they were in a, in response to that. However, there were some parts that I went to, for example, the high sensitivity, a preference for depth, a pre- preference for simplicity, uh, like it, like not wanting to do mundane tasks, that kind of thing. Um, my limited physical capacity and energy where these said, this is just who we naturally are. And our trauma was just that the culture couldn't accept that. Um, so then these, you know, the other protective parts formed. So that was so clarifying and enlightening about this. These were my natural qualities. These are a result of trauma. Okay, so now bringing it to the Enneagram, because yesterday I actually, um, I just, (laughs) I wanted to make sure I was recording. I had a paranoid part there. Um, Yesterday, I was listening to a recent podcast of We Can Do Hard Things with Glennon and Abby and Amanda, who were interviewing Suzanne Stabile, who teaches the Enneagram. Now, I actually learned the Enneagram from Suzanne many years before I learned IFS. And so fascinating. In many ways, it was kind of like a stepping stone into IFS. And at that time, as I read some things and I would take tests and everything, I would test as a five. Now, five is the observer. They're kind of, they have very limited energy, um, very introverted usually, and they love information and research and knowledge and things like that. And I really did identify with a lot of that. But then I took a course with Suzanne where she makes this statement and she made this in the podcast as well. But she says, this is the litmus test for a one. Do you have an incessant inner critic, inner voice that shames you 24 seven. And I thought, check. Yes, I do (laughs) come to find out through IFS. I've got four different ones, but, um, I thought, yes. Okay. Case closed. I'm a one, right. That, that was always, I would always come back to that. I have to be a one because of that reason. So I, I also knew at that time that I had a lot of qualities around two. The two is, so the one's the perfectionist, the five is the observer. Um, the two is the, the people pleaser or giver, caretaker. And at the time I thought, this is not who I really am. This is who I've been domesticated to be through religion and culture. And so I had enough insight to be able to kind of understand that these were parts who had taken on burdens and it wasn't who I really was as a two. Okay. But then again, I'm not going to explain all of the Enneagram, but in the Enneagram, you have your core number and then in stress, you go to a a different number and in health, you go to a, a different number. So as a one in stress, I would go to four. So I started exploring the four, which is the creative. And I really resonated a lot with the four uh, likes to stay in the depths, has a full range of emotion, typically seen as quite emotional and sensitive um, and is very creative. And so I thought it's so interesting because it says that when I'm in stress, I go to four, but it really feels like when I am comfortable and authentic and myself and kind of more healthy, I'm in four. So that was kind of an enigma, but I thought, well, it's just, it's a good place to be, I guess. So I always really resonated and identified with fours. There's a lot of fours in my groups. Um, And I have a theory that a lot of people who are HSP and and neurodivergent are fours and fives and maybe nines. And anyway, but um, so anyway, through, as I was listening to the podcast yesterday, it's kind of like all of these moving pieces came together. And again, for me, what I realized was for most of my early life, I had these dominant protectors in Enneagram one and two perfectionist people pleasers. And that was how I survived 
but who I truly was, kind of my exiles, right? The parts of me that were suppressed because they were not acceptable in the culture was actually more in four and five, the highly sensitive, emotional, deep, creative, observant, limited capacity uh, person. And so while I have said that I'm an Enneagram one for six to eight years, I don't know how many years I've been saying that, I actually had this realization that at my core, I would more identify as an Enneagram four, because once those protective parts were unburdened, when what they protected was healed and they could naturally relax, my authentic self emerged and looked much more like mainly a four and and somewhat of a five. Um, And so Again, I'm not prescribing this for you, but I think as far as people using the Enneagram, it can be tricky because you can actually misidentify yourself with the mask that you have worn all your life or the parts of you that have developed to keep down your authenticity because it wasn't acceptable. And so it's just, it's, it's an interesting exploration. And for me, it's been so worthwhile because what it has led to is not just self-awareness, but self-acceptance and self-celebration and appreciation for those parts of me in one and two that kept me alive and just a resurrection of kind of my natural authenticity uh, that are that are in some of the other numbers. So again, the details may look different for you. I just tell this story to hopefully inspire you to really explore yourself and really to use internal family systems to go in directly. If you're curious, am I autistic or are these parts symptoms of autism or are they because I've had this trauma? Um, if you want to understand yourself better, go in directly and ask and the puzzle pieces will come together. The picture will be clear. And my hope is that it will lead to self love and self acceptance.